How's everyone doing today? Good day, good day. I hope you are well in the YouTube universe. And for those of you who join uh, the playback, <laughs> welcome. If you have not hit the subscribe button, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And go ahead and like this video because it helps to get the word out in the YouTube universe as to, you know, what we're talking about today. If this is your first time listening, I'm Jess, the founder of Black Travelers Network, and I hope you are doing well because today I'd like to have a very interesting discussion. So before we get into the discussion today, I want to make sure that we make it very clear that we are in fact and indeed a travel community, travel platform. And so I want to make sure that you know the trips that we have coming up. And I don't want to date the broadcast, so I will just let you take a closer look at it, at the list. If any of these destinations interest you, I would like for you to make it a point to email us at blacktravelersnetwork at gmail.com. Uh, this is the best way to let us know. Uh, the trip that you are most interested in attending. And right now we're just gathering our groups for these various trips. So nothing has happened at this particular moment in time. Uh, so don't feel like if you've emailed us that you have missed out on anything because we will start meeting uh, fairly soon. Right now, the biggest thing we've been focused on is our travel group that's traveling to Rio de Janeiro for the carnival season. Uh, this group will be leaving in a few weeks. And so we will then begin to discuss our next set of trips, which is, of course, if you look on the screen is Spain, South Africa, Kenya, and Vietnam. But even before we get to that part of the discussion, you can let us know which destination interests you the most and so if you have never traveled with us to brazil our group to brazil uh again they will be leaving probably within the next few weeks and if you would like to be a part of the 2025 trip uh to brazil we always encourage early registration in this case it's a must uh, so definitely email us spacing for next year's trip will be very tight because we can only have so many people be a part of the experience as a result of a number of recent changes in the country. So next year's journey, uh, we are planning in advance as we always plan our journeys in advance. Plus it makes your experience much that much more affordable uh, if you plan and you do it early. So ladies and gentlemen, Let's get into today's topic. And let me just say this. I wanted so badly to talk about the travel lessons that we learned from Cat Williams' interview. Uh, as all of you know, Cat Williams appeared on Club Shay Shay. I think the video right now is at around 42 million views, which is amazing and record-breaking he really did break the internet ladies and gentlemen and so I wanted so desperately to come on like last week like shortly after the interview happened to like highlight the travel lessons we can glean from the Cat Williams interview because surprisingly he talked a lot about travel in that interview uh, on Club Shay Shay. But, you know, I kept pushing the live back because, you know, for me, any topic that I do, I feel like it's important to like feel strongly and passionately about the topic. But I'm not one to force a conversation that quite frankly, to me, it, it, it doesn't get me excited. 
And so I kind of sat back and said, you know, I'm going to wait till the right message comes to me. And I feel like when you partner what's happening with the message that came out of Cat Williams' interview alongside, there's a lot going on <laughs> in Hollywood right now, alongside um, the release of the the release and the promotion of the movie The Color Purple it's just incredible timing that Cat Williams interview because I feel like it really kind of speaks on so many levels to what we're seeing play out right now in Hollywood and in in particular black Hollywood uh, and so I, I, you know, although I kept pushing it back, you know, today it, I feel is an important discussion and it is a travel discussion, believe it or not. There's a lot going on in the world of entertainment and part of the Cat Williams interview that went viral was the part where he exposed what, a, what he calls gatekeepers. Now he named na the names we are all familiar with, like the Kevin Hart's, the Steve Harvey's, Cedric the Entertainer, Ricky Smiley, Kanye West. <laughs> he also talked about Jonathan Majors, Diddy. I mean, the list goes on. Like these are just the, the people I'm thinking of off the top of my head. But for every gatekeeper he named, I hope you caught what he implied and where he did not name the names. And I think that's a, a, a really, I'm trying to find the right word. I think that's the most, one of the most important takeaways because everyone kind of latched on to the fact that he talked about these big name celebrities and talked about them being gatekeepers. Although he didn't name the names of the people in power who pulled the strings, he made it abundantly clear that the gatekeepers are a part of a greater system and that there are real power players and most of whom we see are most of most of the people we see in the fronts. So like, you know, the Steve Harvey's and the Kevin Hart's, you know, these are according to Cat Williams, I feel like what he was trying to communicate is that these, these men are just pawns in a greater game that is being played. See, most people reacted to him calling out the big names that we're all familiar with. But to me, the takeaway that I got was that's not really where your attention should be. It's fine to look at, you know, because it's entertaining but we're not really looking in the places where we should be looking. And that's what I wanna talk about today because that's what I took from the interview. Again, like I said, it's very entertaining, but let's look below the surface. So while Cat Williams' interview is going viral, we have this other bit of drama that is lurking in Hollywood surrounding the movie The Color Purple. Has, drop it in the drop the comments in uh, below if you have seen The Color Purple, the musical, this new 2023 release. I have to be honest with you and tell you that I have not seen the film yet. Uh, you know, I and. I'm not really a big movie person. I hate to say that. I should. <laughs> it's a little embarrassing. I am i don't really uh, make time to watch movies, whether it's Netflix or, or anything on Hulu. I've just, it's been so long since I've been to a movie theater and I don't have a Netflix or Hulu account. So I don't really watch movies, but I do enjoy paying attention to what's go going on in black society and black America and black Hollywood, because I, I feel like uh, it's all very interesting. And this color purple, pur the color purple drama uh, has been 
very, very interesting to see it play out. I mean, people are breaking down folks' body language and, you know, there are all these gossip sites that are talking about who likes who, who's mad at who and all of that stuff, which is whatever. But from the gate, the film had a had a lot of great success during its opening weekend. It moved into the number one spot uh, over Christmas. But the momentum, honestly, for this particular film has declined. And generally speaking, there are problems with the film today that I would say were not necessarily problems with the film back in 1985 when it was first released. Like the 1985 film, The Color Purple, in my opinion, is a classic film. It wasn't a musical necessarily, although it had amazing music bits in there, but it was just a phenomenal cast. Um, you know, I feel like there are a number of people today who feels like the 2023 version of the color purple actually is a film that promotes a lot of agendas. And, you know, even though I haven't seen it, I can tell you kind of like the reviews that I've heard. Uh, and so I'm only going off of what I have heard reported and the issues that a number of the critics in the black community have said about the film is a lot of people have identified that LGBTQ uh, agenda uh, was present in the film. And there were a number of black men who, who felt that it was an anti-black male agenda that was presented in the film. And I'd have to see the film first to kind of judge it for myself. I'm certain it's not a huge departure from the original classic film. Um, but, you know, I think those are fair, uh, you know, fair criticisms of it. If, if you want to criticize the film and say it's full of agendas. But from what I gather that the agendas were much more pronounced in the 2023 version. And, you know, remaking a classic to me is a far more difficult task because especially when we're talking about a film like The Color of Purple, because you are assuming the mindset of black society is in the same place as it was when the film was released in 1985. And that could not be further from the truth. You know, the mindset of black American society has advanced and has evolved in so many ways. So you no longer have black people blindly voting for the Democratic Party without identifying specific needs, desires, and wants, and, and not even just wants, but an agenda for the black community. And people are more people now that we are approaching an election season, more people are t prepared to hold their vote if they don't see uh, specifics that address some of the concerns in black America. I feel like in 1985, that was not the mindset. Although I, you know, I could be wrong. So if anybody was <laughs> around uh, and, and have a strong memory from 1985, let me know if I'm incorrect. But you no longer have a black culture where LGBTQs issues and, and, and concerns are being kept quiet as many people would probably say was a thing in 1985. Today, people are out, they're loud and they're proud. And so there is a different mindset in our society and a, and a lower level of acceptance when it comes to agendas that are pushed in films onto our community. It's a much different time, a much different time. And there's a need, I feel, and I'd love to hear what what those of you who are, are listening, I'd love to hear what you had to say 
about it, but there is a need to tell new stories that are black stories. You know, we need to to see more sci-fi films, more drama films. We need action. We need romance. You know, I think when it comes to the black community, we have a fair amount of documentary style films. We also have uh, a number of comedies that get released. We have biographical fil films that happen like the Aretha Franklins and the Madam C.J. Walkers films, which I'm told were also poorly done. <laughs> so I, I think it depends on who really handles the project. Again, those are, are films that I uh, did not see. But there is a need to kind of like diversify the films that we uh, are, are seeing in, when it comes to uh, black America and, uh, you know, just black society in, in general. And this film, The Color Purple, I feel like I've actually heard quite a lot of buzz around the film. And, you know, Oprah Winfrey, who was one of the stars of the, the original classic, uh, is, you know, definitely heavily involved uh, in the film. But this whole experience of this color purple film being unveiled and rolled out, it prompts you to think, what is going on in black Hollywood? You know, I'm not really sure. It's so frustrating because there are several black film production companies. If if I'm not mistaken, I do believe Tyler Perry Studios is the largest film production studio in the country. And he is also the first black man to outright own a major film production studio. Uh, and I'm talking about on a major level. You know, and so that's really important to think about. But we also had Monique that was open and kind of started the conversation. And I, and this Color Purple film uh, allowed space for Taraji P. Henson to pick up where Monique le left off in terms of bringing and highlighting and complaining about the money and black actresses and pay inequities. And, you know, those are important issues that must be highlighted. But here's the greater issue with the Color Purple film. You know, the budget for the film was $100 million. And to date, the film has only made about $54.8 million, which means it has not even made any money as of yet. You know, it's still falling short of that initial budget. And, you know, to see that we have black actresses complaining about pay inequities, not having any food on set, which is not something that's typical with a Hollywood production film. Uh, there was complaints about not having food. There were complaints about having uh, you, I guess it's the cast having to drive rental cars and everybody wanting to blame Oprah Winfrey for there even being a problem in the first place, which I think is just absolutely ridiculous. You know, when it comes to Hollywood, I feel like we must educate ourselves because just because a person like Oprah has a lot of money doesn't mean that every problem is her fault. And it also doesn't mean that every problem is, is that exists is there for her to solve. Now, to me, I look at this issue with the color purple and I blame the movie studio, which is Warner Brothers. You know, they are to blame. This is a Warner Brothers film. And yes, Oprah is the executive producer, but the studio in this case is at the top of the food chain. It's not Oprah's responsibility to pay for everything, even though she did on the record offer to pay for the food and the rental cars. But this is a Warner Brothers film. So the, the studio told her no. They told her no, and they reserved the right to do that. We in black America, I feel we need to understand the relationship when it comes to 
the Hollywood studios, the production companies, executive producers, producers, directors, actors, and their management teams. I mean, entertainment, the entertainment industry is very, very big for black people in America. It is an, it's a product that we consume quite a bit of. And although we consume lots of entertainment, most of us do not know how those relationships work together. We don't understand the power. We don't understand the flow of money, nor do we oftentimes understand the chain of command and how it works because for so long, black people have been relegated to being the talent and never really fully being paid what we should adequately be paid. There is a lack of understanding on our part, which is why you get unnecessary criticism of players, major players like Oprah Winfrey. I feel like the bigger question that we must ask is how much money did Warner Brothers slate for marketing of the color purple film? How much of that hundred million is was set aside for that for, for that promotion and marketing of that film? That is an important understanding that we we should have, but you know, I don't know that they ever really fully reach release those numbers. I think the estimate uh, has been about 50 million, but it's not a firm number because it almost seems, I hate to say it, a bit of a setup (laughs) when we hear black actresses complaining about pay and problems on set that's related to finances. You know, I then begin to wonder how much was was spent to actually market this film because so far since it hasn't made any money you know it becomes a easy justification on the part of Warner Brothers in terms of explaining why black talent especially black female actresses are not paid comparable to their white counterparts and you know just to highlight some quick numbers that are associated with this particular film is this the production cost of the film again a hundred million dollars and that's assuming that 50 million was set aside for the marketing budget uh it's not a firm number but it's an assumption even with that People are saying that the film must gross between 300 and 300 million dollars at the worldwide box office in order to reach its theatrical break even point. And it does not appear that that is going to happen. And just for greater context, the color purple back in 1985 when it when it was released was a huge success at the box office. It grossed about 98.4 million dollars, which is why, you know, of course Warner Brothers would throw 100 million towards the film. Back in 1985, it brought in 98.4 million against a total budget of $15 million, which is a very small budget to make this film, but it still did really, really well. And so where overseas are they marketing these black films? I'd love to know, like, what are the countries? This is why it's important to travel the world because you can kind of see and get a greater understanding of how different industries play out throughout the world. There are lots of opportunities that exist here in America, but also in other countries. But there are also a great number of challenges in much of the countries that we would consider to be kind of more like black countries, like where the African diaspora is like largely concentrated. 
So Hollywood has all Hollywood already has this belief that black actresses are not worth the same amount as white actresses. So anything they do is going to support that narrative. And today I kind of want to do a quick little virtual travel session around the world to the worldwide box office. <laughs> and so if you were going to see the color purple around the world, you may wonder where would we go? I want you to take a look at your screen. I'm going to put it up. And these are just some of the destinations that you will see the color purple. And on the, on the list, you will see that the film was obviously released here in the United States first. And of course it, it made its way uh, to, to Canada, the UK, and all of the dates are, are shown next to when and where the film is actually going to be released. And you know, the, this is a very, very interesting list because, you know, you can drop your comments below, like what stands out to you about this list? What stands out? Um, because to me, I would not, I would not think to put the color purple in those markets. <laughs> I hate to say it. Um, but I'm sure these are markets where Warner Brothers has, has been a major player in for a while. And because Warner Brothers has, have been a player, uh, in the market for a while, I just think that it kind of is an easier thing for them to continue to go where they've gone before. So you can see uh, Cameroon is on the list. Brazil is on the list. Our beloved Brazil. Uh, it just it was just released in Brazil, of course. Uh, Denmark, Finland, Iceland. And I'm going to show you the next slide. A lot of these are, are the upcoming uh, locations where the film will be released. And again, I feel like so many people do not understand what the worldwide market actually looks like. <laughs> you know, when we talk about black talent and black films and where they go overseas it's one of those things that the studios can easily predict the success of the film and so that's why this film is projected to not do so so well unfortunately uh for uh, the remainder of the spring i think we'll have a real understanding of how much the film actually gross completely on sort of like the first round uh, by by April, by the end of April, those numbers hopefully should be reported. But what countries do you see on the list? What countries are missing from the worldwide list? The vast majority of the countries where black people dominate in population are not on this list. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why are there not more African countries on the list? Why is the Caribbean not on the list? You know, important questions. Very important questions you, you should be asking. But I will say from having spent quite a bit of time on the African continent. Africa is very tricky because film distribution is a challenge on the continent of Africa. There are not very many movie theaters on the continent. Surprisingly, a lot of people don't know that. Surprisingly, there are not very many film uh, theaters for people to go watch movies. And also when we look Nollywood, you know, Nollywood, the Nigerian film 
industry. I just generally say the African film industry because, you know, Nigeria attracts talent from all over the continent. But Nollywood is the number two movie industry in the world behind India's Bollywood when it comes to the annual number of films that are being produced. The big problem that you're going to run into on the African continent is distribution. You get lots of film bootlegging on the continent of Africa because there's not a structured system where people can go consume movies. Now, are there movie theaters? Yes, there are, but it's not nearly enough to uh, really actually accommodate the, the large demand and the large production that exists uh, when it comes to the film industry. So it becomes challenging to even count ticket sales on the continent because of a lack of structure and systems in the various African nations. And so this seg- segues us to Cat Williams and that whole conversation and why his interview went viral. Now, there are many takeaways we can learn from Cat's experience, but The most profound clips from Cat Williams uh, during this viral interview to me are the clips where he talks about travel. And so I'm going to find this clip, the first clip. I only have a couple of clips I want to play for you. Um, but this is the first clip of Cat Williams sitting down with Shannon Sharp on Club Shay Shay. So take a quick listen. So San Francisco, Oklahoma, Sacramento, from Florida, you moved to the West Coast. After, so you traveling. When did you set up shop on the West Coast? All How right. old were you then? So I, I guess I'm uh, 18 or younger, and I, um, once I have my, once I have a child, I realize that um, I can't. It's a lot of things that I could use to make money that now is a no go. So anything with street aspirations that I might have thought about pursuing or been good at. Um, I now am a single parent and I got to redo this thing. So I need comedy to really work out for me right. and me and God go into um, extreme conversation where I'm explaining to him that I'm a crash out dummy if he don't send me a lifeline. Like I need something I can hold on to. Before I had left Florida, I did stand up one time because we was trying to get in the club. I didn't have ID. So I said I was a comedian. They ended up having me do five minutes. But I kept that in my head that I had done that. When we get to Oklahoma, they're having a competition for stand-up. And if you win, you get to go out on the road with uh, Jeff Foxworthy and Dan Whitney, who is Larry the Cable Guy, and Richard Jenny, and these great comics. You get to open for them. And once I did that, I realized, okay, as a comedian, I'm like way behind schedule. I done started this too late. All the funny guys are already funny and known names. Like, how am I going to progress? So I realized that I, I, I do better with a white audience than I do with a black audience. And I, I'm not sure why that's occurring, okay. but the white audience likes me more. That's, that's interesting. So when I moved to Sacramento, it's because Sacramento has a white and a black audience almost 50 50. That's okay. almost the makeup of Sacramento. So I live in Sacramento for two years until I get to the point where I am equally as funny if the room is black as I am if the room is white. Okay. That's not enough. Now I need to be one of the good ones when it comes to black comics. Mm-hmm. So now I have to move to Oakland and that's what lands me in Oakland for three years. Once I have dominated uh, male black comedy in Oakland to my liking, 
Now I'm prepared to go to Los Angeles now. Now I know you can't throw me any curveballs. If it's a white audience, if it's a black audience. So you heard it for yourself. What did you take from what Cat Williams said? Drop your comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Here's what I learned from his comments. And I want to relate it back to the movie, The Color Purple, because these people inside the industry are telling us what's happening. We just have to think about the picture a little bit more critically and understand that Hollywood talent cannot always come out and tell us what's happening directly. So oftentimes they'll send little subliminals, little messages, coded messages, and we have to be able to receive those. Most times, we're going to have to read between the lines if we really want to understand what's going on uh, in Hollywood. And that's for the protection of the, the talent and for protection uh, against people waging claims that they cannot necessarily substantiate with, with hardcore facts. And so Kat threw out some subliminals. You heard Kat say he did well with the white audience. What his content was like with the white audience is worth analyzing at some point. But what's most important is in order to evolve his talent and to be able to do well regardless of the audience, he had to travel in order to evolve as a comedian with both white and black audiences. But it took an active effort and an and intentional work on his part to grow and develop his talent in front of black audiences. When you look at the worldwide list of the box office where Hollywood will release the film The Color Purple, generally speaking, these are largely white worldwide audiences in many of these countries. The only black countries on the list of almost 30 total countries is South Africa and Cameroon. And I'll just give them Brazil. It just depends on the part of Brazil where they're actually releasing the film. But that's not even a real 10% black audience for this film, The Color Purple. And the other thing is think about the message and the agenda behind what is embedded in the movie the color purple if we are to believe what a number of the critics say are saying what does that say about black american people are those images and storylines that you feel you would want to represent and be um, an example of what black history or black life in America is really like. I don't know that I necessarily agree with having that image promoted worldwide. And you almost don't even have to visit any of these countries to know that they are largely white countries if you factor in the people who can actually afford to go to the movie theaters. So the film is being placed in front of a largely white audience abroad. And I want to emphasize that it does not mean that the film cannot or will not do well. It just means that based off of the cast, based off the storyline, based off of whatever marketing and promotions in these countries they put behind it, the film is, is very much in a position uh, that's very challenging to meet the expected or desired goals for the film to actually make money. For Cat Williams, in his story, he highlighted the importance of going to Oakland and working on his craft so he could get better in front of a black audience. And just because the audience is black, Warner Brothers, that does not mean the film is going to be a hit. We all know that. Hollywood is not really invested in developing the worldwide film market so that it is a real reflection of a black audience. 
as well, in addition to the white audience they already have. They are focused on providing entertainment to the largely white audiences that they have abroad. Therein lies one of the major challenges for the black movie and film industry, which is a lack of developed film distribution markets overseas. And it's not like it doesn't exist. It just takes a lot of intentional work to lay the foundation and create it. And I'm sorry, I do not look to Hollywood to do that work. Here's the second clip of Cat Williams and what he said. What's your favorite city to tour in? <laughs> the next one, sir. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the real beauty of travel. Right. That's why most people don't have the empathy and the sympathy that they need to have for other people. Mm -hmm. It's because they haven't seen other people. Right. Like if you went to Ireland and you saw what them people was like, and you went to Sweden and saw what them people was like, if you really went to Africa and you really saw what the people was like, you went to Haiti, you went to Puerto Rico, if you really traveled across the country, you would see that all people is the same. It's way more people that's good than the fucked up individuals you see. And if you understood that, it would change everything. So I don't, I, I, I don't have any favorites in the world just because every place is dealing with their own issues, their own troubles. All places look better than they actually are for the people that live there. Mm -hmm. And it's always a difference between what it seems like and what it, actually and is. What it is like. People will tell you, I went to Paris. I was there at the Eiffel Tower. It, it, bitch, you had bed bugs. <laughs> and there were rats everywhere. Yeah. And the food was terrible. Yeah. Tell the rest of it. Yeah. Don't tell some. In this clip, Cat Williams says, when you travel, you will see all people are the same. Most people are good people. And gen generally, I agree with that. Traveling around the world, you meet some of the best people in the most random places. So I definitely agree with him. I haven't had a really, really bad or nasty experience in all the years that I've traveled abroad where it made me see or think, oh, people are so mean or people are so negative. No, the overwhelming kindness of humanity around the world is just not only very welcoming and warm, but it's very encouraging so that it kind of pushes you and drives you to want to see more of the world. But Kat also highlighted the fact that every place is dealing with their own issues, their own troubles, and that could not be any truer of a statement. Anyone listening have you been following the border crisis at all there have been an estimated 10 million migrant immigrants who have come into the united states since 2021 as kat said people are really the same all over the world when you travel you will find no matter what country you visit Immigration and the border crisis is an issue that unites those people who are legitimate citizens of a particular country. They feel the same way when it comes to large influxes of foreign migrants entering into their country. In other words, South Africans feel the same way about people coming into South Africa from Zimbabwe and Mozambique and other African countries because they have a lot of migrants entering into the country of South Africa. Parts of Europe, they also have a big problem with Africans migrating into different parts of Europe. Brazilians have problems with people who are coming in from Venezuela. They also have Argentinians coming into uh, set up shop and, and live in, in Brazil as well. It's the same challenges and issues and response to immigration around the world. You understand that when you travel. 
When it comes to Hollywood and the industry being made up of gatekeepers, as Cat Williams referred to, ho to the Hollywood system throughout his interview, part of us being able to evolve and advance as a black community, folks, we got to get out there and travel. You have to see different parts of the United States. You have to see different parts of the world and not just from one particular experience and when i say one particular experience i mean it's okay and, and and necessary to travel to have fun and to you know turn up and uh to just kind of relax and vacation but even during those experiences i always encourage people to have a, an an ear open and an eye open to be able to really truly try to understand the country or the place that you're in from, from a, a different perspective. You know, the brothers and sisters who have come uh, into America, who've immigrated here, whether your country is on that list of countries where the color purple is being released or not, especially those who are from the African diaspora, your country needs you to put in work and help build up systems help build up infrastructure and establish a structure within some of these countries strengthen what you have or build what you don't have you are needed and desired that's why i love seeing you know brothers and sisters from the diaspora who live in different parts of the world who make an active effort to go back to their homeland and actually put in work and develop things and build you know infrastructure and do various projects in their country that is needed don't just move out of your country and get comfortable in a different land like your country still needs you and it helps literally everyone <laughs> you know these are not easy tasks to do but as cat williams said quote and i'm gonna quote him again from the clip he said every place in the world is dealing with their own issues their own troubles all places look better than they actually are and that is a direct quote from him including america let's <laughs> let's be honest including america america for those of you who are not in america it looks like an amazing country and it is but it we are not without challenges and problems here as well you know i personally believe that america is the greatest country in the world i am an american i i can't sit up here and, and not say that i don't believe that i am in the world's greatest country i can say that because i'm here my family has been here since god knows when but we still have our problems but for every problem, ladies and gentlemen, is a solution, and every solution creates another problem. Yet in all problems lies opportunity for advancement, both culturally, educationally, and economically. I hope you enjoyed today's topic. Don't forget to drop your comments below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the topic. Stay tuned and don't forget the, to subscribe if you have not subscribed to the channel. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen.